Welcome to the Dory Saves Lives Teen Driver Safety Assembly. Dory Saves Lives is a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to traffic and road safety. Based in Boca Raton, established in 2004, our foundation received nonprofit status in 2005. The foundation is named in memory of Dory Slosberg, the daughter of former state representative Irving Slosberg, whose life tragically ended when the car she was in crashed while she was unbuckled. Emily Slosberg, Dory's twin sister, survived with serious injuries. Auto crashes are the leading cause of death for teens ages 15 to 20. In 2019, almost 2,400 teens in the U.S. were killed, and about 258,000 were treated in emergency departments for injuries suffered in motor vehicle crashes. That means that every day, about seven teens die due to motor vehicle crashes, and hundreds more were injured. Today, we will discuss the following topics, drunk or drug driving, distracted driving, and seatbelt compliance. Driving while under the influence of drugs or alcohol may seem like fun, but in reality, it leads to car crash, death, and arrest by police. The outcome of that is a ruined future, a lengthy jail or prison term, and pain and suffering for yourself your victims, and affected family members. Let's watch Dory Saves Lives impaired driving video entitled, This Could Be You. This Could Be You is proudly sponsored by Cersei Denny, Attorneys at Law. Each year, thousands of teens who get good grades and who've never been in trouble before die on the highway or kill someone else because they did something stupid like drinking and driving. Tragedy never happens to you. It always happens to someone else. I lost my daughter, Dory, in a car crash. We want you to understand it could happen to you. This is the story of four people who never thought tragedy would happen to them or their families. This is the story of the cheerleader, the up and coming foodie chef, the drug and alcohol counselor, and the college student on spring break. We begin with the cheerleader and the up and coming chef. In half an hour, her life is gonna turn upside down and someone's gonna be dead. Carly Tomica was a cheerleader at Treasure Coast High School in Stewart, Florida. She grew up with everything she ever wanted. After graduation, she moved to Miami Beach, where she was a full-time college student working two jobs. One of those jobs was here at the Nikki Beach Club on Miami's trendy South Beach. I was the youngest person to work there. I was only 20 years old. And everyone that I worked with drank on the job. It was kind of like a part of the job. Stefano Riccoletti was an up-and-coming chef working in a trendy Miami Beach hotel. Negotiations were underway with the Food Channel and others about his own show. He was a fantastic chef, and he made a lot of money as a chef. And they were working on him having his own show, his cooking show. So in the process of that is when this accident happens. By now you've guessed who got drunk and stupid and who died. Here's how it happened. The Nikki Beach Club surveillance video captures Carly dancing behind the bar, having a good time. As dawn approaches and the club is closing down, she starts to act sloppy. Yeah, that was like where she was stumbling around. She leaves with a manager, then she heads for home. Stefano was on his way to work in the pre-dawn hours. Carly was traveling 50 to 60 miles an hour, weaving down Collins Avenue on Miami Beach. At Collins and 18th, construction forced Stefano out of the crosswalk and onto the side of the street. Here comes Carly. 
I thought that I had possibly hit a barricade or something in the road because at the time there was a lot of construction on Miami Beach. But it wasn't a barricade. It was Stefano Riccoletti. Stefano was hit with such force, these police photos show he was literally knocked out of his shoes. Carly kept going, oblivious to what happened. How much were you following a car to this kid? A uh, man, I'm calling, telling you, I'm just, yeah, as far as I know, this man, he must have killed him, you know? Stefano was indeed dead. He flew 58 feet from the point of impact. Large chunks of flesh are visible on the ground. His head explodes like a watermelon on impact. His face, unrecognizable. Police say calls from a witness helps them catch 20-year-old Carly Tomica at her apartment complex where the witness followed her nearly 40 blocks north of the crash. Not looking like the pretty party girl any longer, Carly is arrested. Police find a big chunk of Stefano's scalp under Carly's passenger seat. Parts of his brain matter in her hair. This good Samaritan helped us out not only immediately finding this person and getting her off the road, but in the future when she goes to trial and help prosecute her and getting her put in jail where she belongs. Officers have charged Tomica with leaving the scene of an accident involving death. Stefano's unsuspecting wife, Patricia, got a call at work just after 9 a.m. Police insist she meet them at her home, telling her nothing until she sees them in person. Anxious uncertainty is building each second as her mind races with the possibilities. Stefano being dead was not one of them. I went home and I found a police car in front of the house and um, I said, what happened? And they said, well, we can't talk to you. We really need you to sit down. So we went in the house and uh, they made me sit down and then they told me uh, that Stefano had an accident. So I asked them, well, is he okay? Is, is he gonna be okay? And then they said, no, he, he actually died. So at that moment was, I stopped for a second and I couldn't believe it. I said, how, how is it possible? Because Stefano is not the kind of guy that dies. Stefano is immortal, he's strong, he's healthy. You can't, you can't just die. <laughs> how are you gonna tell your kids they lost their dad all of a sudden? It's not something you just say. <laughs> For Carly Tomica, in the back door of the Miami-Dade Courthouse. Horrendous trouble for the 20-year-old self-described Miami Beach Party Princess. Now, this day, facing more charges. DUI manslaughter. Toxology reports show her blood content after the hit and run at 2.25, three times the legal limit. Uh, the victim in this case, Mr. Riccoletti, she stuck him. The impact was so severe, Judge, that it caused brain matter, flesh matter, skull matter to scatter about Collins Avenue. With her parents standing by her, Tomica fought to stay composed. In life, you make choices, and you clearly made choices that night. You made choices to drink. You made choices at this point in time. I mean, it's indicated that your levels were um, beyond anything ordinary. That you... The judge slapped the 20-year-old with a $77,000 bail. Tomica cuffed marched off to be booked. The judge orders mandatory AA meetings, no drinking, no driving, and the judge orders house arrest and a GPS ankle bracelet. As more months pass, Patricia forgives Carly and prosecutors offer a plea deal. I killed him that morning. I had been drinking while I was at work. I got very drunk. I hit him with my car and I killed him. The 20 year old will spend four years in prison. Driving away and leaving him to die was inexcusable. A very different shaken and remorseful Carly Tamika appears in court. I know that my actions utterly shattered the hearts of his wife, his children, his friends, and all who knew him.
Carly Tomica had a model life. She grew up in a nice family. Had no prior arrests until the night she let drinking get the better of her. And that forever changed her life. I was an honors student. I was a varsity cheerleader. I had a lot of friends. Um, I spent a lot of time with my family. I worked three jobs in high school. Um, I, like I said, I had everything that I ever wanted. Great family, a good boyfriend, decent job, good grades, great friends. And now I'm in prison without any of that. Prison is not easy for Carly Tomica. It's horrible. It is the worst place in the whole entire world. Um, I live among 70 other women from all different backgrounds, all different types of people, not people that I would choose to be around. Um, it's a big room full of bunk beds and you have people inches away from you, sleeping below you or above you. You share bathrooms, showers. There's not any doors on the bathrooms. Today, Carly is here at Lowell Correctional Institute outside Ocala, Florida. She's one of about 700 inmates who no longer have a name, but have a number. It's not the life she imagined for herself. This wasn't supposed to be in my plan or my future. Like I said, I was responsible and I didn't drink and drive. It, it's not something that I did on a regular basis. It's not something that I took part in. It's, I s slipped one time and look where I'm at. That decision that I made that night will dictate the next 21 years of my life. That's how long my sentence is. Carly's conviction shatters not only her life, but that of her parents as well. They used to be able to brag about how great I was, and how, how well I was doing, and how responsible I was, how I was off at college and working and on the dean's list. Now they say that I'm in prison. This is all real, it's not a dream. I'm never gonna wake up and everything's gonna be gone. I'm really in prison. This is all real. This happened to me. And a lot of people say, oh, this could have happened to me or this could have happened to anyone. Lots of people drink and drive, but it didn't, it happened to me. And people shouldn't take it so lightly, you know? It, I think people think the worst thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna get a DUI. And they might lose their license for a year, but that's not the worst that can happen. People lose their life and other people lose their life. All because of your poor decision making. I have nightmares that I go back to court. I have nightmares about the accident. I have nightmares that I get into car accidents myself. Um, I have all different kind of nightmares. They're usually about either court or getting into another car accident. I did something wrong. I broke the law. And I deserve to be here. You killed uh, Stefano. Yes, I deserve to be here. Carly will be here until May 2017. After that, she'll serve two years of house arrest and then 15 years on probation. And if she does anything to violate that probation, including drinking again, she could be right back behind bars for the rest of those 15 years. Our second story is about two kids out for a final fling at the beach on spring break. Daniel Rocca was just 19, but his date, Sofia Fuentes, was 21. 
What could have been a budding romance turned to a nightmare. And it's a nightmare Daniel Rocca has most every day and will likely haunt him for the rest of his life. What are the odds of finding someone like me? Want someone like you? Daniel and his co worker left Gainesville for St. Augustine Beach on the last Friday of spring break in 2011. Rain forced them from the beach but not before drinking a couple of beers. They decided to head to Jacksonville. They stopped for a high octane energy drink loaded with alcohol. Abruptly, Daniel changed his mind about going to Jacksonville and made a U-turn. Driving fast, weaving in and out of traffic, a mist fell on the road. I told him maybe we should pull over because I was scared and I was, I was kind of screaming and crying because I was scared. I don't, and I told him maybe he should slow down. As Daniel roared up on the slow moving truck, he veered left, passing the truck. A car come out of nowhere, about hit us, run us off the road, caught the tail of the right tail end of a Lexus. Witnesses describe the crash this way. That vehicle was just directly in front of you, I guess to your left in the left lane. It was, it was to the left, it, 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 she was she was to the left, right in front of us, 40, 40, maybe 30, 40, 50 foot. Okay. And it, when it went around, it said, it, it, I don't even know why the guy was going like that. Because okay. it had no, he could have went nowhere. Right, right. Driving the luxury car, 52 year old Donalyn Frank, a drug and alcohol abuse counselor. He had to be going every bit of 80 to 100. Okay. Had to be. He was every bit of 100 mile an hour, I guarantee. Donalyn's silver Lexus began spinning counterclockwise on a wet road. She crossed the median. Spun her around in oncoming traffic, and that's when the other green car hit her. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Retired teacher Gail Marston was driving a blue green truck. The speed limit was 55, and before her eyes, the silver Lexus was in her lane. Her life flashed before her eyes. There was nothing she could do. The front end of her vehicle planted itself well into the driver's side of the Lexus. Gail Marston lost a leg and to this day refuses to talk about what she saw from the driver's seat. A text message from her son says, talking about the crash is emotionally unbearable. Gail's truck crashing down on her was the last thing Donna Lynn Frank ever saw. Once we were in the back of the vehicle, there was a strong smell of alcohol. Surprisingly, Daniel and Sophia got only minor injuries. Their white compact turning upside down, skidding into a ditch filled with water. Daniel admitted to investigators he'd been drinking. Toxicology reports would later show his blood level three times the legal limit. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. The son of a chemistry professor was arrested and charged with DUI manslaughter. It was just a, a, a terrible tragedy. Prosecutor Chris France realizes Daniel was just out on a date, but he has forever changed the lives of four families. You have Gail Marston, who uh, was retired. She was beginning a retired life to enjoy the fruits of her labor, if you will, and her injuries to her body. Uh, will will last her, uh, her suffering will last for the rest of her life. Now when you look at Donald and Frank, uh, her surviving daughter um, was obviously distraught. Um, you know, her mother was her best friend. I live a clean and healthy life, thank you God. Haley is happy and healthy and safe, thank you God. And she used to write stuff like that a lot, it was like positive affirmations. Unlike Patricia, who forgave Carly in our previous story, Donna Lynn Frank's only daughter is still angry. My best friend, my, my only family, like, and she was taken from me that quickly without me getting to say goodbye, without me getting to say anything. And it was like she was just like stolen from me. Like it's just not fair. Like she didn't get to see me have a child. She didn't get to see me have a family of my own. She wasn't, like she was just taken from me. For 17 years, Donna Lynn spent her life with Joe Smythe. The two were planning a wedding that will never happen. And she drove off and she threw me a kiss. That was the last time I seen Donna. 
the news that she was killed in a car accident shattered my world. Daniel is now serving the remainder of his sentence at the Orlando Reception Center, where he works in the kitchen. Uh, I had a great family, a good upbringing. I went to a good school. I was in college. I had a full-time job. I was making minimum wage, but I, I had a full-time job. Um, and now I feel like I'm destined for failure. But you're going to get out. Yes. And um, the woman who you killed, she there is no way out. I killed one woman. I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for her death. You know, she'll never, she'll never walk again. She'll never talk to her kids again. Judge Wendy Berger sentenced Daniel Rocca. Sentencing guidelines give her few options. No prior record. Good family. Serving 12 years in prison. And basically a kid, although over the age of 18. If you drink and drive and you're going to prom and you're a high school senior, you're going to be charged as an adult, more than likely, and you're going to come before a judge. And the very minimum that you score on a sentencing guidelines score sheet is 10 and a half years with no prior record. And so these kids who are 16, 17 years old, I mean, 10 and a half years is more than half of the life that they've already lived. Since Donalyn's death, Daniel's mother has suffered a heart attack and undergone surgery. He knows he's been a disappointment to both his mother and father. I guess it was the things that he didn't say, which, which, which meant a lot more. Just the, the way he looked at me sometimes. I grew up respecting the man. And, uh, you know, had I listened to his advice, like I said, I wouldn't be in, in, in this position um, if I was responsible and just gave up the keys. What are the odds of finding someone like me? What happened to Daniel Rocca can happen to anybody, given bad weather, bad decisions, and too much to drink. I don't think people understand how easy it is to get caught up into something like this. I don't, I certainly never thought it would be. I've, ta I've talked to, a, damn near everybody I talk to about it says, you know, that, that could have been me. You know, I've, I've, I've drunk, you know, I, I, they, and they go on to tell a story about, you know, the time that they drank and drove and did something that they shouldn't have done. His life is now, for all intents and purposes, ruined. He will rebuild parts of it. He'll struggle the rest of his life with the guilt of what he's done. He'll struggle uh, with the rest of his life of being a convicted felon and not receiving uh, 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 chances for employment, opportunities for student loans. I wish I could go back and change what I did. I, w I wish I could do it more than I think you guys understand. What happened to Daniel Rocca can happen to anybody, given bad weather, bad decisions, and too much to drink. Carly and Daniel, will forever be haunted by the fact that they are convicted felons. What are the odds of finding someone like me? Drinking and driving is against the law. Carly and Daniel found out it can have life-altering and life-ending consequences. I'd say this is one of the most important subjects taught in high schools. Driver's Ed is one of the most important because what good is education if our kids are dead? Every day we get up, we go, we drive in our cars is one of the most important classes. And it's not, we're not trying to keep you from having fun. It can happen. And I don't want it to happen to anybody else because I know how it feels. This Could Be You is proudly sponsored by Cersei Denny, Attorneys at Law. Please keep this video in your heart and mind and never drive or ride with anyone under the influence of drugs or alcohol.
what is distracted driving? The pictures on this slide show us some very dangerous examples of what you shouldn't do when you're behind the wheel. Distracted driving is engaging in anything that takes your attention away from the task of safe driving. It is extremely risky behavior that puts everyone on the road in danger. Some more examples of distracted driving are texting while driving, scrolling on social media, video calling, talking on your phone, watching an event outside your vehicle, adjusting the radio or air temperature, checking your GPS, interacting with unsecured pets, and daydreaming. The different types of driver distractions are visual, taking your eyes off the road, manual, taking your hands off the wheel, and cognitive, thinking about anything other than driving. Making a quick phone call while driving could cause you to lose your life. Dialing a phone number while driving increases your risk of crashing by 23 times. Texting while driving engages all three types of distractions, visual, manual, and cognitive, making it the most dangerous of distracted driving behaviors. Taking your eyes off the road for even five seconds could cause you to take someone's life, save a life. The life you save might be your own. I lost my twin sister February 23rd, 1996, 10, 10 p.m. I know what I'm here to do. I survived, I'm the only walking survivor of the crash. I, I didn't even know what happened. I'll never, I wake up in a hospital bed. I broke my leg in five places. I broke my pelvis. You know, and the only reason I'm here is because I want to make sure that others don't go through what I and my family went through. We have to do something. It might not be everything, but we have to start somewhere. And this bill is a, is a step in the right direction. This bill would make texting while driving a primary offense, meaning currently it's a secondary offense. So you cannot get pulled over for texting. Virtually, every other state in the nation, you can get pulled over for it. This affects me, you, your kids, your aunts, your uncles, your friends, and every single Floridian and every single visitor, every single guest in the state of Florida. And it is time that the legislature acts Section 316.305, Florida statutes, went into effect on July 1, 2019. Motorists can be stopped and cited for texting and driving. As of January 1, 2020, motorists can be issued a citation for not using a wireless communication device in a hands-free manner in school and work zones. Inspired by House Bill 107, Dory Saves Lives developed the Spread the Word video PSA contest for high school students. Nia Holmes is the winner. We'd like to take a moment to congratulate her and watch her video. Next is the true story of a high school student named Sydney who was texting and driving while unbelted. I remember people texting me and saying, like, do you hear what, what happened to Sydney? Is it true? Like, 
and I check Facebook and all of a sudden there's all these like, I love you Sydney, RIPs, and I'm like, what? So I tried calling her, she didn't answer. I tried calling her mom, her mom didn't answer. And then finally I drove her to her house and she wasn't there. It was horrible. She was the most amazing person that I've ever met. She was never like that person to like put people in a bad mood. She was always trying to put people in a good mood. She was one of the best people I know. Her heart was so big. I've never met anybody with a heart as big as hers. Uh, we were working on building a tree house in our backyard and uh, Sydney very much uh, wanted to be involved and help out and you know I'm up on a ladder uh, trying to shingle the tree house and I'm a little nervous being up there and Sydney climbs up and she's laying across the roof uh, nailing shingles and she didn't have any fear. She helped us build our tree house roof and I remember um, seeing her out her windows in the backyard on top of the roof, hitting in nails. And then a piece of Sydney that was very unique to her, I think, versus other teenagers, is she still had a very big kid heart. She was a girl that liked to play, and she liked to ride the swings with me. We had talked about going to the pumpkin festival, and I told her that I wanted to go. And she was like, yeah, I want to go too. She runs down steps, she's got her bag, and she's like, okay, I'm going to Vicky's house, love you, see you tomorrow. I said, okay, not knowing that was gonna be. The last time she ever spoke to me. That night they were heading back from a pumpkin uh, farm and they were heading down the highway and um, Joe, the passenger, was looking at his cell phone and he felt the car jerk. It hit on the other side of the grassy median and flipped the car over. I was very close to hitting the car myself, so I kind of closed my eyes. I think it slammed on my brakes, and that's whenever I got out of the car and, and saw Joseph jump right out. Um, and I realized that he was searching for Sydney, so um, that's when I started helping him look for her, and I, I saw Sydney in the ditch. At that point, still didn't really have a full grasp of what happened. I just knew that it was a vehicle that crossed the median rolled over and somebody had been injected, to which me immediately being um, uh, able to say is that the seatbelt wasn't born in the case. I started calling hospital after a hospital and so finally they answered and told me that she was there. We were using medications for her blood pressure to keep her heart beating. Um, we were using the ventilator to keep her breathing. We finally made it to the emergency room and when the highway patrol people showed up and he said she was ejected from the vehicle. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt. <laughs> I thought, why? Why did she have it on? And then the, the ER doctor comes in and he's like, she's very, very sick. She hit her head and we're gonna try to take the swelling down, but where she was hit, it's, it's very unlikely that we're gonna be able to do anything for her. Her mom answered the phone at the hospital and told me to come up because she wasn't going to make it and to come say goodbye. We knew the whole time that we were at the hospital that we were going to have to have a conversation with our kids and let them know that she's not coming home. And it was, it was almost like hear, hearing it again because you're experiencing their brand new grief. I started crying and I was like crying against my mom and hugging her. We miss her tremendously. Uh, we keep her in our conversations on a daily basis. She's still a very integral part of our lives even though she's not here. I miss having fun with her. I miss I'm being friends with her and playing elephant sand. A lot of stuff like that. Um, there was still a, a lot of unanswered questions of why. A bunch of cops like came over and started like asking me a bunch of questions like, where were you going, what happened, why did you swerve off the road? And I was just like, I saw that when we were going off the road, her, she like threw her phone. Start putting everything together and realizing that this is a texting and driving crash. Um, we were able to specifically say it was texting and not anything else. Learning from this for Sydney, you know, because it affected us as healthcare workers, it affected us as people, it affected us 
um, as mothers and aunts and cousins and sisters. This is something that isn't just going to affect you. This is something that so it's so formidable. These kids don't need to be so distracted. There's nothing that's important enough that's going to cause you to lose your life. There's not a single thing important enough. For some reason, she made a bad decision that day. She clearly was touching her phone, and whether it was texting or looking at something on her phone, uh, that caused the accident. And she also made a bad decision not to wear her seatbelt. That caused her death. Joe was a front passenger in the car. He was wearing his seatbelt. Um, he walked away from the collision. Vicki was a passenger in the rear seat. Uh, she had the lap belt on, but she had the shoulder belt behind her back. I broke my arm, I broke my neck, and I broke my back. For the longest time, I blamed that whole thing on myself. Like, I could have stopped that if I was not on my phone texting my mom. I don't remember the accident. I don't remember what had happened. I was sorry that I didn't get to tell her bye or that I loved her, or that she just wasn't going to graduate with us. I was sorry that it even, like, happened. Distracted driving leads to 1.6 million crashes every year. So eyes on the road, hands on the wheel, all the time. Wearing your seatbelt in Florida became a primary offense on June 30, 2009, thanks to the Dory Slosberg and Katie Marchetti safety belt law. The law requires that all drivers, all front seat passengers, and all passengers under the age of 18 fasten their safety belts. Drivers and passengers 18 or older can be cited if they or any passenger under the age of 18 are not properly strapped in. Teens as both passengers and drivers have the lowest rate of seat belt use of any age group. Seatbelt statistics show that the consequences are deadly for not using seatbelts. In 2019, 36,096 people died in motor vehicle traffic crashes on U.S. roadways, with nearly half not wearing a seatbelt. In Florida, 41% of those who were killed in motor vehicle crashes where seatbelt use is required chose not to wear one. Seatbelts save lives. This safety animation will show us the danger of not wearing a seatbelt in a vehicle.
The safety animation that we just watched showed us the importance of wearing a seatbelt. Seatbelts save lives, but only if worn correctly every time you're in a motor vehicle. In a crash, your seatbelt keeps you from being ejected from the vehicle, from being thrown against other passengers, the steering wheel, or the windshield. And your seatbelt keeps you behind the wheel where you can control the vehicle. Want to join us in making a difference? Join Dory Saves Lives Road Safety Teen Advisory Board. Become a Dory Saves Lives Social Media Teen Road Safety Influencer. Or join Dory Saves Lives Distracted Walkers Awareness Teen Safety Committee. And yes, you will receive community service hours for your participation. Special thanks to all the driver's ed teachers who teach students essential defensive driving and decision-making skills, which aids in making our roadways safer. Special thanks to our safety partner, the Florida Department of Transportation. Please drive safe for Dory.